Do you dither? Do you drizzle? Do you know the difference between dither and drizzle? Do you know exactly when to drizzle? How much? Which options to select? If you know all that, what are you doing here? If you don't know all of that, let's meet us right after the trailer. Hey, this is View Into Space, I'm Sascha from Switzerland, so great to meet you and thanks for watching my channel. Drizzling is quite a complex topic. I always wanted to cover this topic and still also I was sometimes a little bit intimidated about it. That is until last week's, actually the two main German astrophotography channels made videos, brilliant videos about drizzling. And I want to give the credits here to Frank Sackenheim of Astro Colonia and Daniel Nimmerfall, the biggest Austrian astrophotography YouTube channel. And both of these videos completed kind of my script, which I already have. If you speak German, I would actually recommend that you watch these videos. I put the link in the description below. If you don't speak German, well, you're stuck with me. So I will guide you now through the basics from what is drizzle, what is required to drizzle, to showing you how to do it in Astro Pixel Processor and in PixInsight. And I will show you best practices and what really the results are. So let's get started. So let's start with what drizzling is. And that's actually the most complex part. So first of all, where does the name come from drizzle? So imagine that you have a light rain drizzling on a muddy field. So each droplet that comes down will actually leave a small imprint in the mud. But when there are many, many, many droplets, at the end, the whole thing starts to even out. And that's kind of the concept what we're doing here. So drizzling is in principle a resampling technique. So we redistribute the signal and noise of individual pixels to neighboring pixels. And by that, increasing the resolution and the sharpness of the images. And the interesting part is that drizzling was invented as a workaround for the Hubble Space Telescope. Because once they shot the Hubble Space Telescope in space, they realized that the camera was actually undersampled, which led to blocky stars, which didn't look nice. So given they could not just go right up and replace the camera, they had to find a workaround. And that's when they invented drizzling. And today we're all using it. Or if you're watching now this video, perhaps you're not doing it right now, but I guarantee you, you will do it after you watch this video. So for the about 1000th time, also I will now show you this picture here, which might look familiar to you because it comes right out of a publication which was done about drizzling but there's really no better picture to show you how it works. So what you actually see here are pixels. The red squares are the original pixels. So what we do now, first of all, we draw a grid with a higher resolution. Then we decrease the size of the original pixels and distribute them now on the higher resolution. And through dithering, the movement of the telescope Every time we make a photo, a little bit to the left, to the right, to the up, to the down, we actually get more sample points. And through all of that, we calculate a new picture, the drizzled one, which through this technique now has a higher resolution and increased sharpness. Now, given I did not study astrophysics, that is all I can tell to you or how much my brain actually lets me to understand this topic. But I think that's enough that you know what it is and that we can now discuss how to apply it in your processing. But so the advantages of drizzling are on one side that you have afterwards a higher resolution, which means blocky stars get rounder, structures might be more defined, the noise might also a little bit decrease. And drizzle can also in some cases effectively address geometric distortion. So with that, let's come to the requirements. The first and the most important requirement for drizzling is dithering. If you do not dither, you can not drizzle. It's impossible because drizzling relies on that the picture have this 
dither motion. And your pictures do not only have to be dithered, you also need enough pictures. So the minimum you actually need that you can drizzle the pictures afterwards is around 30. Below 30, you cannot drizzle. There's just not enough of this dither information around. The recommendation is between 50 and 60 pictures, the least to be effective in drizzling. And the second requirement is your data has to be undersampled because the whole point of drizzling is that you can actually recover this data which was hidden based on your undersampling. And if you're not undersampled, there is no data that can actually be recovered. But there is a caveat to that. If you're doing one shot color shooting, you should always drizzle. But if you're not undersampled with a scale of one, so you do not increase the resolution, you keep the resolution as it is, but you still drizzle. And that's, for example, a requirements for doing SPCC as outlined by PixInsight. So from a best practice point of view, from a drizzle scale, so how much you actually increase the resolution, I would say in practically all cases where you're undersampled, two is the perfect answer. If you go higher than two, your picture gets so large that it's almost unmanageable. And I think the incremental increase in quality is neglectable. So I would keep that always at two, as long as you're undersampled. It gets a little bit more complex when we talk about the drop shrink. So how much we decrease the size of each pixel. And the issue there is that the smaller it gets, so the more you decrease the size, the sharper your picture gets, but also the noisier, and the higher is the likelihood that faint structures in your picture get lost. There is also a direct connection of the quality of your data and the number of exposures you have done to how much you can actually decrease your pixel size. So from my point of view, if you have average data and just around 30, 40, 50 pictures, I would go about with a 0.8. If you have 200, 300 pictures, you have you had stellar seeing, you might actually go to 0.6 or something like that. But if you want to stick on the safe side, I would stay at around 0.8. And the advantages you get from drizzling are still sufficiently big. And last but not least, and I mean here not least very literally, once you did the drizzling, always do deconvolution. Because that's really when drizzle shines. That's really the killer feature that is enabled by drizzling. And I think we can name here BXT, the blur exterminator, by name. When you use BXT on a drizzled picture, the impact it has is huge. It's much higher than when the picture is not drizzled. And in the same way, only drizzling a picture without using BXT, you just go half the way or not even. So with that, we go now to my computer and I will show you there everything in detail. So the first thing we have to do is we have to see if it actually makes sense to drizzle because remember we have to be undersampled. So for that we go here in the tool of RC Astro which is called MTF Analyzer and that's for free. Just enter this URL, I will put it in the description below and you're set to go. So I usually like to think in focal length. So I select here focal length and focal ratio and now you have to enter your telescope so for example, if I want to look now at my 103 APO from ASCAR, which I just received. So we go here to 700 millimeters focal length. The focal ratio is an f-stop of f7. Seeing, we just assume average seeing, so about two arc seconds. Wavelength for the moment we leave and default. Pixel size, you have to enter the pixel size of your camera. For the most common cameras, the IMX 571, for example, it is 3.76 micrometers. Then enter the sensor size and we have everything we need. So what do we see here? 
So we have here actually the diffraction limit of the telescope and nothing and nobody can actually bring anything back which is on this side. But everything that is on this side here, which is here the pixels, so that's actually the real undersampling plus anything that has to do with the seeing can actually at least a certain amount by deconvolution and by drizzling be brought back. And that's actually everything that's read here. That's the undersample part. So we are a little bit undersampled. You also see it because these numbers here are red. So if I go now here on drizzle two times, as you can see, the red here disappears, this here disappears. So now everything that's caused by undersampling can now be brought back. So let's make now another example. For example, I want to use now my 0.6 reducer, which brings me to a focal length of 420 millimeters and a focal ratio of an f-stop of four. And what you see now is that now the undersampling is really, really massive. And if I go again by a drizzle two times, I almost completely eliminate this undersampling. It's still a little bit undersampled. Now I could say I go now to a three time drizzle, then I would completely remove it. But again, I think this is looking at this here, this is questionable if this is still makes sense, I would still stick with a two time drizzle. But just to show you now the other extreme, if I now would take my CPC 800 with about 2000 millimeter focal length and an F stop of, I think it's 10, then you see there's no undersampling at all. And in these cases, when I drizzle, I don't get anything back. Doesn't make any sense at all. So that's why this tool is so crucial and thanks a lot to Russ for making this free and available to us. With that, let's actually see how can we drizzle. And I will show it to you in AstroPixel Processor and in PixInsight. So in AstroPixel Processor, you have to go to the tab number six, Integrate. And down here, you already see Drizzle Integration. So this here is the default. You have the mode here on Interpolation, what means it doesn't drizzle. Now, when we wanna do drizzling, we change it to drizzle if when we have mono data and we change it to buyer x trans drizzle when we have one shot color data. I have mono data, so I go to drizzle. And now right down here, we have the scale. I go here on two, that's most common, which means now our picture will now double in length and in height. And then up here, we have the kernel and I would just leave it here on the default top hat kernel. That seems to be the best one. And for the droplet size, we can go to about 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that. This really changes a little bit on the quality of your data. The better the seeing was, the better the quality of your data, the more pictures you have, the lower you can go and vice versa. And that's actually all you have to change. And now you drizzle. And with that, we go now to Pix Insight. And yes, I know we have WPP, but I want to show it to you first in the individual processes, what has to be done to actually drizzle. And especially here, I want to really give credit to Frank Sarkenheim, who actually showed it in exactly this way. And I really liked it. So, I shamelessly copy it here, but not without giving the credit to him. So the first process where actually drizzle appears is in the star alignment. And you see it right here, generate drizzle data. So this has to be selected, but it's default. And then actually when you do the star alignment, it will generate here, not just the picture which are, which are aligned, but also the drizzle files. With that again, if you would not utilize WPPP, you would go to image integration. And now you would actually add here the pictures that have been star aligned, 
but you would also have to add here the drizzle files which were generated here. And then down here you have to select again generate drizzle data. And once it's integrated we would actually go to this file here drizzle integration and here you would actually have to enter again all the drizzle files and here actually you can enter now the same data that you already have seen in AstroPixel processor. So we have a scale of two, we could give a drop shrink of about 0.9, 0.98. The kernel function we leave usually in PixInsight on square. If you have one shot color data, you would actually click here on enable CFA drizzle. With mono data, you will keep this deselected. Now given 99.9% .9 of all people do not use these processes at least for the stacking purpose anymore but they use WBPP here. And I want to show you here in WBPP where you can find the drizzle settings. You go here to post calibration and here is the drizzle configuration. So you have to enable it, you have to give the scale, you have to give the drop shrink you leave it on square, this I would leave on default, and you see you don't have to enter here the one-shot color, the CFA, and the reason is that it recognizes it when it's a one-shot color picture. So in principle, no matter if app, no matter of picks inside, there is not really much to do, you just have to know what the scale is, what the drop shrink is, and what that really means. But now the question is, does Drizzle really work? Does it really make a difference? We heard now so much about the theory, about how to do it, but what is the effect? And I want to show it to you now with this example. So what this here is, is the Pac-Man Nebula. I shot this picture in October and this is the H-alpha exposure. All I did, I let gradient correction run over it, I cropped it a little bit, and that's it. Nothing else done. It is a good example because it consists of over 100, 180 second shots. So it really ticks all the boxes. Also, it was undersampled, so we should see some results if, as we claim, Drizzle does help. So let's see now. So what else do I have here? I drizzled it. On the first one I did not drizzle it while stacking. Here I drizzled it. We call it mid because I took a middle solution with a drop shrink of 0.8 and I drizzled it twice. And then we have here strong which is again twice drizzled but with a drop shrink of 0.5 so much more aggressive. So obviously in this resolution we don't see any difference. Impossible. So what we do now, we zoom now in. And this is a one-on-one -on -one shot. So really full resolution. We have here some stars. We have here some nebula. So we really should see some changes if there are some changes. So let's start none versus mid. I did put them now on top of each other. And now we start to toggle. So this is none. And this is mid. So let's first of all focus on this large star here. Non, mid. You see how it gets actually much sharper? There's a definite improvement, which I hope even through the YouTube algorithm should be visible. Second of all, let's look here at the noise. And what you will see is that the noise is less visible with the drizzle than without. Now look at this area here. And you see that it's much sharper. So at least now on my screen, it's visible. Now I will put on top the strong and we will compare mid to strong. This is mid, this is strong. And we see practically the same all over again. Strong, if you compare the star, it gets even nicer. 
when we look here, for example, the noise, it disappears. And also here, look at that again, much sharper. But there's a word of caution, because what I showed you now would imply that it always is a wise choice to go to a drop shrink of 0.5. And that isn't the case. Depending on your data, actually faint structures might start to disappear. So you're actually not only removing the noise, you also start to remove stuff which you wouldn't want to remove. From that point of view, it's always recommended to stay at around between 0.9 and 0.7, I would say, but not go lower down because we have a much better way how we can improve this picture. And this is within these three files, bxt. Again, I did from all of these three exposures, I did run bxt over it, and we will see now how much it changed. So we will start now with none, no drizzle at all. Obviously the stars, they get smaller, they get sharper, that's nice. Also here we see some improvements, definitely but they are within reason, I would say. It's not a wow effect. And with that, we do now exactly the same with the mid version. So the 0.8 drop shrink. And the effect here with PXT is much, much bigger if you look at the nebulosity than it was before. Also, for example, you look in, in this area here, it's really nice how all the little details are appearing. And so we try that again with the strong one, with the 0.5 drop shrink, same obviously here. But quite honestly, if you look at that, I feel already that overdoes it a little bit. This looks not natural anymore when I look at here. This looks like forced. And also that, by the way, so shows a little bit that you can go too far, that you can drizzle too much. So from my point of view, the 0.8 version is probably the best. And when we now compare no drizzle, no BXT with drizzle and BXT, then I think it's quite clear why we're drizzling, why we use Blur Exterminator. And here we can now also easily over the whole picture see how massive it changes it. So that was it. I hope I was able to shed a little bit light in this rather complex topic. But what if you have additional questions? Obviously, you can always leave a question in the comments below, but the much better way is that you actually join my Patreon channel. And I'm always there for my patrons when they have an issue, when they need some support. Link to my Patreon channel is in the description below. See you next time and clear skies.